Hi everyone, welcome to Intermediate Day 2. First I'm going to ask a question. Have you ever had an unmet expectation? Possibly hyping up a movie or a TV show or a music album so much in your head that when you finally get to see it, it's just not what you thought it was going to be and you're kind of underwhelmed? I felt that way with the Divergent book series. I really, really liked the Hunger Games series, but then I read the Divergent and I didn't finish the series. I was not very impressed with it because I hyped it so much up in my head. You know, when you're really excited about something, it just might not deliver. That movie you were waiting to see may have been a dud. The sporting event didn't go your way. Your family vacation might not have been the way you wanted it to be. The school dance wasn't as fun as you may have thought. The time your parents may not have punished your sibling as much as you thought they should. And when you thought you had a friend and that friend may have turned out to be gossiping about you or not being the person you thought they were. If you've had unmet expectations when it comes to faith, you're also not alone in that either. In fact, Luke, the guy that wrote down some of Jesus' teaching, recorded the details of a character who had unmet expectations. If you have a Bible, or a Bible app, or would like to Google this verse, you can. We're going back to Luke 15, verse 11, the parable of the lost son. Luke 15, verse 11 to 31 is the parable of the lost son. We're going to read through that again today because that is the main focus for this series. You can follow along in your Bibles or just listen if you would like. The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squanders his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything any food to spare. And here I am starving to death, he said. How many of my father's servants have food to spare? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he now was found. So they all began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you give me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. You never gave that to me. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property and with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now found. The last session that we had, uh, we focused on the younger son. But right now I want to focus on the older one. If you would like to grab your notes, if you are making them, you can do that now. And we will start with this. The first thing. The older son asked a question with ulterior motives. We saw this in verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing. 
and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Picture this scene. The older son had been working, working and working. He'd been working late and rolled up to see the biggest party going on at his house. How would you feel about that? Me? I think probably I would be mad. I'd feel left out. I'd try to put on a good, happy face though, indicate that nothing was wrong, but I think I'd be pretty furious inside. I think that is how the older son might be feeling here. I don't think the question is necessarily a kind, what's going on here? I think it's more aggressive, like maybe, what's going on? As if the party should be for him. Have you ever had someone ask you a question with ulterior motives? You know, a question that doesn't quite seem like the real question is what they're trying to get at. Possibly a question like, uh, your parent or guardian says to you, hey, how is math today? When you know they mean, what's the deal with your math grade? When are you going to improve that? Your mom wonders, hey, what is your schedule this Friday night? When you know she really means, will you stay home to babysit your sibling on Friday? Or maybe a friend asks, so what do you think about that guy or girl? When you know what they really mean is, I think that that guy or girl is cute and I'm going to ask them out. Will this ruin your friend group or will they be upset? I think we've all been on the receiving end of a question with an ulterior motive. But here's the deal. Those questions can stand in the way of building genuine relationships. When we begin conversations with ulterior motives, we're hiding a bit of ourselves and without realizing it, ending the relationship up for failure. So the first thing we need to recognize about the older son is the older son asked a question with ulterior motives. The second thing to notice is the problem with looking for faults in others is that it leaves you unhappy, stressed, and frustrated. There's an example of this in verse 28. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go inside. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me. And in all that time, he never gave, you never gave me one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Did you see that? The older son didn't call his brother brother. Instead, he said, that son of yours, as if to cut off that strong relationship. The older son was angry. He even said to his dad that he never gave him even one goat for a feast. I don't know about you, but I tend to think the dad gave him something. At least something, right? But in the moment, the older son was so angry, he was not thinking straight at all. The problem with looking for faults in others is that it leaves you unhappy, stressed, and frustrated. We often play this comparison game with other people. We take note of what people wear, how athletic they are, maybe how smart they are and what they look like, and then we scheme together to figure out how we can be better than them. We call out their faults in order to make ourselves look better. In doing this, we think we might be happier, but we're not. Finding faults in others actually leaves us unhappy, leaves us stressed, and if we're being honest, it may just leave us frustrated because we know it doesn't work, but we keep on doing it anyway. The older son was very unhappy and stressed and frustrated in this moment because all he was focusing on was the faults of his brother. The third thing to recognize about the older son is God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. In verse 30 through 31, sorry, we see that his father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. You've stayed by me. Everything I have is yours. The father is pleading for his son to see the bigger picture. Yes, there's a party for the younger son, but everything the father has is the older son's. The father did not respond to the son disrespectfully by saying, well, if you're going to act out about it, you won't have anything. The father remained faithful to the older son, 
And God does the same for us. God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. So here's the deal of a difference of values and rules. Values establish what we care about. Rules establish what we are told to care about. So at something personally for me, I would say that connects to this is the thought that I need to listen to all of the mainstream music that all of my friends or people who go to school with me might be listening to. Even though, as a Christian, some of those things, not all of them, not all of the songs I was listening to, but some areas of things that I was listening to made me turn on my Christian values. <sighs> values establish what we care about. Rules establish what we are told to care about. That is, it's maybe difficult to think of because you may be thinking of a personal story now yourself where you go, wow, my values were really pushed aside in that situation. In order to experience life's changes, some of your rules need to become values. After hearing the character of the older son in this story, some of you might identify with this character. And I challenge you, oh my goodness, and I challenge you to take a step. What step do you take, you might think? Maybe you try to need to stop asking questions with ulterior motives and stop trying to get your way. You could replace those ulterior motives with questions that are genuine. Perhaps your questions could be ones where you actually want to get to know a person instead of expecting something from them. Maybe you need to stop looking for faults in other people to make yourself feel better. Maybe you're viewing your friends as a competition instead of who they really are, friends. Doing this, it might leave you unhappy, stressed, and frustrated. What would it look like to take a step and stop looking at their faults Stop looking at people's faults and instead celebrate what is good about someone. That may be a step that you might want to take. Or maybe you need to take a step and start remembering that God is faithful. It seems like everyone else is getting everything else and you're just left out in the field by yourself, but maybe that's not actually the case. Maybe your step can be to realize that the blessings God has given you are great. Maybe start by writing a list of those things that you might think God has blessed you with. Anyone who knows Jesus as their savior will have eternal life in heaven beyond this world. That is the greatest blessing. I don't know what step you need to take, only you know that. And I encourage you to be bold and courageous as you take this step. But what I do know and what I am confident in is that God sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life die a wrongful death, defeat death, and through Jesus, we are known. I really hope that you enjoyed today's video. We're going to end off this video by praying together. Again, I believe that the power of prayer can go through our virtual boundaries and that that is an amazing thing. Dear God, I really thank you for the opportunity that I have to deliver your word to this virtual audience. I pray that all of the people watching this video today know that they are known and loved by you and may be able to take a step from this teaching. I pray that you are with us. I pray that everyone stays safe. And I pray that Golden Lake Camp will be a place that we all get to meet again next summer. In your name, amen. I will see you all on the next one. Bye.